we didn't necessarily have a lot of conversations about how to make this tense, how to make it more thrillery. And it was very much like trying to think about a character, trying to get into his head and try to create a world that reflects his internal life. And when the story progresses, you see how it definitely like dives into darkness. And I think it was kind of, for me, that was one of the also reasons why I loved it, because the complexity of, of it in terms of how it shifts is something that, you know, draws you in. Hello and welcome everyone on the next episode of We Need to Talk About Oscar. Today I'm joined by Veronika Tofilska, who directed the first four episodes of Baby Reindeer and co-wrote the script of Love Lies Bleeding. Hi Veronika, what a year you have so far. How does it all feel? Oh, it feels great. Yeah, it's really good. I mean, very lucky to be part of both of the projects and they're basically coming out at the same time, which... You know, it was coincidental, but oh, very, it's great. Were they far from each other uh, when you were actually working on them? Uh, no, no, they weren't. In fact, when Rose was in um, New Mexico filming it, I was filming Baby Reindeer. So <laughs> they were basically parallel. And then when she was editing it, I was editing Baby Reindeer. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get started by asking how you see Baby Reindeer as a whole, because I heard people refer to it as true crime or dark comedy, thriller, horror, you name it really. But it's just really hard to put into a box or describing it. So what did you first think when reading the script? Um, yeah, I think I never really thought about defining it as a genre because it just felt so idiosyncratic. And I definitely knew about the fact that it was autobiographical. So that's something that was on my mind. So it definitely felt deeply personal. I never thought about it as a true crime. It's not your usual crime drama at all, really. Definitely never thought about it as a horror. <laughs> I think I mostly saw it as a dark comedy with thriller elements. I think if, if we have to if we have to define it, although I don't think we, def we necessarily should, but you know, gun to our heads. Yeah, maybe thriller, that comedy. Mm -hmm. And also, as originally this was a, a one-man stage play, how did you approach the adaptation process? Because you had to create something that is visually interesting on the screen throughout, but I guess have to keep this intimacy of the one-man play. Yeah, I mean, I to be completely honest, I wasn't actually adapting it because that that part of the the job was done. So I got the script, which was written by Richard and developed by Clark Oral Films, and it was already the adaptation of the stage play. And I really didn't see the play in person, and I read the script first. So only after I think I read the first episode, I was sent a link, a v Vimeo link to the play, and I think text of the play as well. And I watched it, but I'd say not that relevant at this point because really what I had in front of me was a very good script that was written for television. And uh, can you share how you got the director's chair for the project? Were you approached or did you apply? How did that work? Um, yeah, I mean, I was approached. So it was very standard. It was um, something that was sent to me through my agent. And yeah, I, I think Clark and Will Films, I've met them previously. So so they knew about me and they, they sent me the script. And I, like, in a very standard way, I interviewed for the job and I came and I pitched and I had several meetings before being offered the job. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm curious, how was it decided who would direct which episodes? Mm, I mean, I was being put forward and interviewing for the first block. So I, I definitely knew that if I get the job, it would be I would be opening the show. And that was really important for me. Then I believe there was a bit of a conversation between me and the execs in terms of which specific episodes I would do and 
which was great from them. I was basically given a choice. So I could have chosen one, two and the end of the series as well. But because I read episode four, I realized that I absolutely have to do that episode. So I decided to do the first four episodes. And as regards to actor direction, of course, this must have been very different from usual as the story was based on Richard's own experience. And he was also leading the show. So how were the dynamics between you and him as an actor and him as the creator? Yeah, I mean, it was actually pretty straightforward. Richard, he's an actor and he, he's been acting in, in films and TV before. And so he was very much used to working with director. And he welcomed notes and he was very collaborative that way. And because, you know... I mean, actors are different, but obviously, you know, when you're director, you're the one in front of the monitor. And so you're able to see things that maybe they they don't have that external view of it. So for most actors, it's really important to have that second eye, whether you wrote it or you didn't, you know. And sometimes maybe in that case, uh, a bit of objectivity is quite useful. So Richard was great in terms of working and wanting to hear notes. Um. You were masterfully creating tension and anxiety. Can you walk us through your initial vision for the atmosphere of the series? Yeah, so it's interesting, but we very much followed the script and it was very organic. So I can't say that me and DP Krzysztof Trojner, who was um, this amazing uh, Polish DP, We didn't necessarily have a lot of conversations about how to make this tense, how to make it more thrillery. And it was very much like trying to think about a character, trying to get into his head and try to create a world that reflects his internal life. And that sort of automatically meant that we are in this permanent state of tension. So we weren't really kind of pulling any genre tricks, if that makes sense. We weren't kind of like engineering suspense in sort of thriller way. We were very much just doing this, following this character, taking the viewers on this journey and the events themselves and what was happening to him were creating this. And obviously, you know, when we were talking about things that are purely visual, so, you know, things like, production design or lighting, we very much knew that we don't want it to necessarily feel like a traditional comedy either. Obviously, there maybe would have been temptations from other people to make it kind of more jolly and <laughs> colorful and kind of to to go against the drama sometimes. But we, we, you know, our taste is very Eastern European and we definitely lean into the darkness a lot of the time. So I think that might have contributed to that atmosphere. But again, it was more to do with the inner life of Donnie Mm -hmm. than with us trying to make a thriller. Did you bring your own team to your, like the technical parts, like cinematographer or production designer? Yes, so Krzysztof Trojner is someone who I knew from way back, from the first film school we went to together. And we did a few very small things together, but obviously we were friends as well, and I knew how incredibly talented he is. And Clark Rowell Films and Richard were very open to working with a new talent and recognised you know, his potential, which was really great. And it doesn't often happen in a TV scenario that a cinematographer with not much TV experience get that chance. So that was great. Then Debbie Burton was someone who was already actually attached to it. I think with production designers, they do need like a quite a big lead up to the production. And because Clackerel Films worked with her previously, they already attached her before even the director came on board. But I was very lucky because... I think she was amazing and we got along really well and and she with Krzysztof as well. So we we had a great team. And then really most of the other crew were people that we interviewed. So Krzysztof was really the only person that I brought who I worked with previously. Nowadays, we obviously have to incorporate modern technology into film and TV more and more. But for me, it often feels 
weirdly forced, uh, but I love the use of emails especially here. So how did you go about this side of the filmmaking? Yeah, um, that was actually a quite a complicated part of it. And I think it took us a while to figure out how we're going to do it. So it was quite complex because there's several ways of using those emails in the show. So obviously we have emails on screen. So we have Donnie looking at the screen and and reading them out, which was a bit more straightforward. At the same time, we knew that the the amount of shots that we have of computer screens was so big that we we really tried to pay attention to it. So it's not just like an afterthought. So we kind of tried to do quite a lot of coverage on that. And not only on the screens themselves, but also in terms of any cutaways to Donny and have a variety of close-ups and inserts. And, you know, we, we had a combination of both having actual graphics already on set, but because of the number of them, you know, we didn't have everything. So we also used, you know, empty screen, gray screen. And then we then in post-production, we put graphics in there. And then on top of that, we had the emails being displayed on a black frame and typed in as if Martha was typing them in. And that was something that was already written into the script, um, but we had to find the right aesthetic of those emails. I think we experimented a bit early on with thinking about doing something a little bit more complicated, but we, we, we settled on something very simple. And during the edit, me and the editor, Peter Oliver, we already kind of put something temporary in, which we were sort of thinking, oh, that's going to be temporary. But actually, basically, this is what ended up in the show. And that was, I think, me finding a font that was quite close to old Nokia font. So that font that is the sort of baby render font is a bit similar to the font that Martha has on her little Nokia phone early on in episode one. Let's talk a bit about the structure of the show. At the mm -hmm. beginning, in the first three episodes, it starts out establishing the relationship between Donnie and Martha. And the focus is really on the stalking. And I would say this is the more thrillery side. But in episode four, obviously, the rug completely gets pulled from under the viewer with the flashback. Um, mm -hmm. And it actually changes everything you've seen so far. So did your directorial approach change with that shift in the show? Not really, in a way, because because again, we really follow the script and we follow the story and we follow the psychology. So we like the the, the main idea for the show was that we are in Donny's head, that we were seeing things from his point of view, and obviously when that when the circumstances change and when the events change, and however his life changes from. Perhaps meeting Martha, we're seeing him having a bit of fun and things going better for him. And then the more the story progresses, and especially when we go into the past, the story obviously gets more dramatic and we see him descending into this, into darkness. And in that way, we just followed him. We just followed him. And so in that sense, it didn't really change. Like my, my approach didn't really change because that was the key. And I think hopefully the, why the, the show feels consistent across those few episodes is because it was always Donnie that was the common element. And the way we kind of saw things from his perspective was what kind of glued everything together. But I think obviously you're right that it changes from episode one to episode four. And, you know, there's definitely elements of it that have shifted again quite organically i would say you know score was one of them we have music we have score uh, composed by evgeny and sasha galperin who are amazing composers and so initially we have martha's theme which is this quite sort of sweet slightly sweet but also haunting melody vocal melody and that's something that we kind of see an episode introducing for episode one and then we see it changing through the first few episodes and then in episode four the score changes and maybe loses some of that playfulness and becomes more of a dramatic score and and becomes more eerie and i think similarly you know the lighting changes becomes darker 
But again, none of it was kind of put on the show kind of externally. It was all very much coming from what was on the page and what was in Donnie's head. Well, episode four is its really such an achievement. And not only the story, but visually, it's also super strong. So, for example, okay. when we are in that uh, exclusive pub in Edinburgh and Donnie and Darian are talking day after day and the camera is just going round and round. Or the use of lighting when Donnie first gets really high, not mm -hmm. to mention the asset yeah. trip. So can you expand a bit more on the visual choices you made here? Yeah, again, I think it was very much inspired by what was in the script. So we, we tried to really enhance what was written in and kind of achieve the best version of it. But we very rarely tried to do something that was kind of, again, artificially put on, you know, trying to kind of make things interesting for the sake of it. So the scene in, in the club, I think it was already uh, described in the script as sort of the world swirling around and you know it wasn't specifically explained what the idea was but it was more of an impression so when we were talking about it we felt very much that we should literally be going around and the challenge of it was that it was very much a sort of interplay between the voiceover and Darren's dialogue, which meant that with every spin of the camera, we had to hit a particular moment to witness Darian getting a particular line out, which basically meant that it was had to be precisely timed and we had to have the dialogue being performed by the by Richard and by Tom. And just in the moment when the camera was in a particular place, we were capturing a specific lines of dialogue. And then we had to have our essays crossing the camera and the particular time during that spin, then to create a cut off point, which obviously was extremely complicated. We had an amazing grip team, including Lewin Harrison, who unfortunately has passed away. And I think episode five is dedicated to him. And he was amazing. And he, me and him and Christoph like worked quite a lot together trying to achieve those quite complicated shots. And he was so precise that, you know, after a few takes, he was able to achieve that like precise timing. Yeah, which was amazing. So obviously all these shots were quite designed and quite complicated, but it only makes, made sense for us in moments when the story was really asking for that. And in terms of the lighting in the drag scenes, again, in the voiceover, uh, the scene was described as, you know, Donny feeling like there was a, there was a hole in the ceiling and it was a light kind of shining on him and, ocean waves kind of washing over his body. So we knew that if we're going to have that voiceover in, the visuals can't be weaker than <laughs> that description. Like for the audience, they have to hear his voice and, and feel the same as what he's describing. So we knew that we need a strong visual, but we didn't want it to feel artificial or tacky. So instead of creating some kind of like magical VFX element, we wanted to just enhance and enhance something that is more real and create something that is beautiful. And I think Krzysztof Troiner, you know, his, his idea for the lighting in the flat was very much that at night that we would have a street lamp outside of the window, which would be this sort of orange color, which in general, in Darren's flat, created this slightly claustrophobic and unpleasant, a bit sort of hellish feel. So it felt like, like in, during the day, there's quite a normal flat. And then during the night, there's this sort of orange light in it that kind of makes it feel uncomfortable. And then we were sort of thinking that when Donnie gets high, that street lamp there becomes this amazing beam of light that is sort of, it's almost like gold and kind of makes everything glow and makes Donnie shine, which was like a big part of our thinking in terms of lighting for the show because spotlight is a, a big theme in the show because of Donnie's stage appearances and him wanting to be in the spotlight and we use spotlight in a sort of more heightened way throughout the show so that was another moment when he kind of was supposed to feel a bit like he's in the spotlight so that was mm -hmm. that was the thinking 
well, sexual abuse against men is something you hear very little about. And for me, Baby Reindeer was such a gut punch because of that, but I'm incredibly grateful for it. Usually men's mm. pride and masculinity doesn't allow for such openness and vulnerability. So it's mm. truly a wonderful work. Thank you. Actually, thank um, you. Obviously, obviously, this is credit to Richard and his honesty. And what's amazing is we, we, we've heard about certain charities like We Are Survivors, basically saying that after the show, they had such an increase in terms of people reporting and reaching out. And that's really encouraging. And that's really amazing that, you know, a TV show can have that effect beyond just, you know, entertainment. Now that we are nearing the end of the interview, I wanted to close it with a bit of self-reflection. So were there any scenes that you were particularly proud of? Hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, it's interesting, you know. I think there's, you know, there's many things that I felt I'm proud, proud of, you know, sometimes not necessarily the the most kind of flashy <laughs> moments are the ones that kind of stand out. I think one scene that is to me, also because I just felt in terms of both Richard's and Jess's performances, was the scene when Dolly takes Martha home and they have a conversation and Donnie asks Martha to stop and he breaks down and eventually he breaks up with her and obviously Martha has this very emotional reaction and I just remember having this feeling on the day that you know together with the actors we achieved something special that through you know from the first take to the last take you know we went on a journey and that felt very gratifying and I think at some point, because of the different you know, production and financial reasons, you know, this scene was one of the ones that was considered to potentially be cut from the script. And I remember, I think me and Richard both really wanted to stay. And I'm so glad that we kind of, we, we protected that scene. And it's one of my favorite scenes at the moment. The show ended up being highly successful, but when you wrapped up shooting it, did you have that feeling of, yeah, this is going to be great or, or how did it feel? Oh, um, you know, it was very up and down, I think, throughout. I always knew that this is a special project. I always knew this is an amazing script, amazing, and I always knew that the actors are incredible and that the team that we assembled, you know, from yeah, DP and production designer and editors and composers, and I was really in awe of everyone's talent, but I would be lying if I said that I knew it's going to be a big success. And also throughout the edit, you know, you, you see different versions of it and you, you're so close to the material. So, you know, still uh, to this day when I watch it, I see a lot of the flaws of it, you know, I see a lot of the things that I could have done better and things when we kind of fell short. And I don't think maybe they're as visible for other people than for us, but they are definitely there. <laughs> so sometimes you're too close to the material to actually see its value. But I'm very happy about it. I'm very surprised. I'm obviously over the moon that people are loving it. And I hope really it's going to encourage more producers and more streamers to look for original material and more unique projects are going to be made in the future. Mm -hmm. And what do you think really lies behind the success of Baby Reindeer? Because it's honestly, it's a, it's a weird show to be this, I don't know, for audiences to like it this much or watch it for mm -hmm. this long, because it's been the number one on Netflix for quite a while now. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's connecting to people on for different reasons. Why it's the element of surprise. And I think one is that we a lot of people came into it as something that they discovered and that they did not know anyone in it. They didn't know the story. They didn't know what's going to happen next. And I think in the environment when there's so many shows that are almost versions of the same things we've seen before, there's a lot of remakes, there's a lot of IPs being redone time after time again. It's very rare that you see something that you haven't seen ever before. So I think that's one of the reasons. The other element is that it is a very personal show. 
And I think people knowing that a person involved in it has written it and he's playing himself, I think that's another level of honesty that people recognize. And I think, again, being so close to life and and, and it feeling so personal, I think it's another attraction. And I think as well, it's extremely entertaining, engaging and funny. And I think that that is a very important mixture. I think people love things that are funny. And I think in the sort of darkest genres, uh, you can find elements of humor. So that's definitely something that I love about the show, personally. It's, it's that sort of lens through which we kind of see life, which is a bit distorted, a bit humorous. And that's what makes it ultimately unconventional. And lastly... After having seen your directorial work on this and your writing in Love Lies Bleeding, I'm mm. super excited about your future plans. So do you have any mm. new projects in sight? I mean, um, I'm definitely working on several things, but there's nothing uh, official yet that mm -hmm. I can... <laughs> but I'm very excited and I'm very happy that people watching Baby Radio and Love Lies Bleeding Well, Veronica, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for the opportunity and thank you for Baby Reindeer. I love the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next up, I am joined by the first four episodes cinematographer, Krzysztof Joynar. We like to start our interviews by asking our guests about their core memories that either made them fall in love with films in general or made them go into filmmaking. Can you recall a moment or period in your life which you can associate one of these feelings with? Yeah, I, I mean, I probably have quite uh, drastic memories, actually. I think the most kind of the, the ones that kind of stick to in my head was basically like when I was a kid, like my family, we, we were, you know, we were going a lot to, to watch the movies and... Uh, But I and my brother was into cinema as well. I think he was in just beginning of high school. So I must have been about, can't remember exactly, but surely it was, I was like about somewhere between 12 or 14. And two films I remember to this day are Requiem for a Dream and Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> and for two reasons, I thought they kind of left a very strong impression on me and like what film can do to you in a way i remember in both cases it was it was just uh obviously they're quite heavy films but i do remember a strong response of like both times it was like a very immersive experience and i didn't really felt it before and i was really moved by it where cinema can take you as an audience, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Did cinematography pop up to you to some point? Because especially these two films are, yeah, really strong story-wise, but the cinematography just as well, it's really up to par with it. Yeah, I think with Saving Private Ryan, I think for me it was like, and I, I can't remember exact year when I watched it. I think I didn't watch it when it came out. I think I watched it on DVD. So it was still, you know, it was small screen, but I remember vividly how how much of an impression of horror and terror it brought. And literally, I remember the sound of bullets and the kind of point of view. I still, to these days, I have these images in my head. Yeah, I think it was, now I only realize it was all about like the immersive experience how they captured it and how they the point of view that they introduced was i think that's why it was such a powerful film at the time but yeah uh, yeah it's, absolutely it stays in me forever and then requiem for a dream it was just it's funny because I, i'm not actually a fan of like a fast montage films <laughs> i'm actually like quite like a sort of uh slower narratives Like, I, I think that's, I don't really think in that kind of very fast paced motion. It's one crazy drive. It, it was, it right. was yeah. really impactful. And I remember I watched it in cinema, so I must have been like 
yeah, 13 or something. And uh, it was definitely probably not to go <laughs> watching at the time. Uh, but I think my brother really was excited about it and he wanted to show it to me. So I was like, yeah. Well, we don't even know how different life would be for you if you, <laughs> if I know. I mean, if you yeah. didn't see it. <laughs> yeah right there and then so <laughs> it's, it's i mean it's a it's a particular film to be growing up with for sure but i mean i've watched other films that were a bit more poetic i said but yeah i think it was the those kind of immersive experiences are definitely something i'm always moved by i think yeah and how did you end up shooting baby reindeer Oh, uh, so me and Veronica sort of go way back. We actually studied in film school in Poland. And so I know her since a long time ago. And then she moved to England to study at the NFTS. And that was sort of on my mind as well. So I kind of joined two years later. Uh, so she graduated when I did my MA at NFTS. And then, and yeah, and then we worked on some small projects together before in the past. Then Veronica jumped into TV and we really wanted to work together. I really wanted to work with her, but I didn't have the TV credit. And then somehow I got this opportunity to work on a series called 1899. And I think after that, the producers kind of agreed for me to shoot the first because it was the first block of Baby Reindeer. So yeah, so Veronica called me and asked if I want to interview for it. And when I read the script, it was, yeah, it was like... Not a tough choice. <laughs> not a tough choice. I mean, it, it was clear from the start. It's a really, the story is just incredible. And you just couldn't, like, you know, walk past it in a way. Mm. Yeah. And um, what I want to start our little dissection of the series with, is the question of the genre, because for so long, we, the audience, can't really decide what genre is this in front of us. How did you find this balancing between dark comedy and pure drama, which is closer to you in style, and how did this affect your work? Yeah, that's interesting, because I don't really watch many comedies, and... <laughs> I'm not so much into the genre of comedy. And that kind of felt strange when I read the script. I was like, okay, well, this is funny, at least at the start. And it at the start, it feels almost a little bit, you could say, I mean, I, that's probably a wrong word, but like slightly domestic. Everything about this world is, you know, it's pubs and flats and, you know, it's, but then you re you know when you read into the characters and when the story progresses you see how it definitely like dives into darkness and i think it was kind of for me that was one of the also reasons why i loved it because the complexity of of it in terms of how it shifts is something that you know that draws you in and i think you know, to a point where when we were talking with Veronica about it, it's like it starts as a comedy, then it shifts to, as you said, drama, because you you suddenly, your, as an audience member, relationship to Martha is like, first you're laughing at her, but then you start to feel for her. And then next, she's harassing Donnie's girlfriend. And then, well, we were thinking then in the episode four, it almost ends as a horror. Like it almost goes into that territory of like a horror genre. So, well, a real life horror genre, if I can say that. And uh, so, yeah, that, that was incredibly interesting. And uh, yeah, definitely exciting to, to explore. And a bit of a technical question. Mm -hmm. Camera and lens wise, how much bigger room did you have at the recurring places like the pub? the comedy clubs or later in Darian's place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it wasn't, wasn't definitely one-to-one. -one. I would say with pub, it was actually a long scouting process to, to look for pubs. And then eventually we have built it uh, in the studio because we scouted so many 
and it just never felt right. And we wanted space in the pub to move around with characters and to tell the story of Marta sort of chasing, following Donnie around the space. And we always wanted to have that feeling in the kind of the storytelling montages. Whereas with Darian, it was really interesting because we actually changed the size of the space as we were shooting it. So for example, the corridor in Darren's house, when Donnie takes acid in the final sequence and rounds down the corridor, we changed the length of the corridor and doubled the length. So when he's running through it, I don't think many people see it immediately that like they don't feel the shift. But actually, the corridor, instead of four, is eight meters long, yeah. for example. And I think space-wise at Darien's flat in episode four, it was, that would be a sort of your regular size of a flat. But then we did some adjustments as we went, like with the long corridor, with taking some walls out in the bathroom to sort of tell the story. and enhance the reality of it, if you know what I mean, to create more expressive feeling, like with the corridor, for example. We've talked about this already a little and danced around it. Episode four is absolutely heart-wrenching. We go on this trip with Donny that first feels euphoric and then not so unexpectedly, as we could suspect it to some point, it turns into something absolutely frightening you also said a sort of horror um we can or should i say we must spend some time with this first of all the most eye-catching part of it the lighting and then the camera movement as well both characteristics execution is done in such an ambitious yet fully realized way mm. can you no pun intended shed some light on the work and progress behind these aspects on this episode specifically, especially since this was your last? Yeah, I mean, this was in a way the most ambitious episode. And uh, what was great about it as well was that I think it becomes even more subjective and more, more expressionistic in a way that it just starts to almost portray the emotions or the feelings of a main character through space and lighting. And I think that was quite, but we'd never wanted to kind of overdo it in a way. And we knew that there, there will be all the, you know, drag sequences. And I think we were always talking about never making it over the top or too trippy because we kind of still wanted to keep that feeling of being with Donnie and kind of having a, almost a realistic experience of it, never sort of going into a, some kind of a psychedelic world be or distortion, because I think it will kind of take you away from the horrificness of it. It would just kind of more, I don't want to say glamorize, but you would like fantasize it more rather than give you an, a sort of a harsh impression what it is for Donnie. So, so that was the task, I would say. And then, and also it was about starting sort of fresh and bright with Rich, with Donnie at this festival and his beginnings and, and let's say, uh, some kind of innocence. And then the story kind of diving into a darker place. So, so, so yeah. So. We thought about that. There was a lot of voiceover written for this episode that somehow kind of gave you an idea of or hints of where this could be going. And also like, for example, when he, the first times he gets high on the sofa and he talks about it, you know, it also refers to like an idea of spotlight, that kind of, that street light that kind of gets enhanced through his experience of high becomes this spotlight on him. And you can see it in kind of two ways for me, because it's on one hand, it's, it's the hallucination on the other is Donnie in the spotlight 
the, the performer whose story is kind of going somewhere else. Like it doesn't mean it's not necessarily a bright future, if you know what I mean. So yeah, so definitely we were talking about how the street light changes from objective street light that you see when he enters into this kind of more expressionistic shape when he gets high. That was the lighting. And then as the kind of the series of taking drugs continues to the finale, to the Darien's dance, we thought that when he takes acid, we wanted to have the feeling of of the sort of light shifting its shape a little bit. So that was initially, it, it was actually now in the cut, this sequence is cut into two angles, but initially it was always a shot where we look at Richard, Donnie in a wide shot, and then we track in closer and closer all the way to his eyes as the light starts shifting, where we replace the ceiling with like this very long, two meter long asteroid. I think they're called Hyperions. So we had like a light chase in the ceiling that was shifting from sort of normal domestic light into this kind of red hues moving around the room a little bit. Uh, so that was another idea about the lighting. But we also talked about how we want to portray Darien's flat in a way that as soon as you enter, there's something a little bit off about it. But then at night, it turns into this sort of weird nest of, of horrible things. And uh, yeah, that's a probably not perfect metaphor, but um, but yeah. That it was all about the shift and and kind of where it's going, I would say. And I don't want to just jump all over the first three episodes because as the episodes go by and our knowledge and just the plot, the story deepens. Something I realized is even though we are zoning in on the relationship between Donnie and Martha and Donnie and Terry, plus of course by ep episode four, Tony and Terry and. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it somewhat feels like we are being transferred into a figurative bird's eye view setting, which perfectly showcases this alienating feeling that's just growing and growing all throughout the series. Can you talk a little bit about this task for you as a cinematographer? Because it sounds like I'm saying all these <laughs> big words and great turns of phrase, but you had to figure out how exactly this can be translated into something captured by you and your team. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, it was few things, uh, like few technical things involved in that. I think, you know, at the beginning, I think we wanted to be a little bit more normal, like as the story develops, like majority of the show is shot on 35 mil. And it's large format, 35 mil, so it still feels, let's say, relatively neutral. And for example, in Darien's flat, we're moving into using of 25, I think, and then 16 for the start of the Darien's dancing. Although we used, predominantly in Darien's, we used wider end of, of lenses, whereas majority of the show, I would say it's pretty much 35. Um, um yeah, so that was one of one of the ways to do to kind of shift the perspective a little bit. And I think also, you know, I think in the beginning of the show, I think we're always sort of between characters pretty much all the time. And then, you know, in the episode four, we start to like de detach and maybe camera sometimes has this like autonomous feeling where it like, as you said, like it flies off and shows them in the top shot that that and 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 kind of tracks back and goes away from Donny as he gets high. Uh, and and you know, like also sort of strange perspective when they're talking on the sofa. 
I think those things would, you know, like I think those little things build a feeling of like they kind of contribute to to the feeling we wanted to get in episode four. Whereas at the beginning, I think it's more about the characters and their dynamic and sort of intrusion of Martha and her movement around Donnie, I would say. Whereas episode four kind of shifts into this kind of more distorted world and the camera almost deforming the reality to tell the story, really. And as we are wrapping up, coming off such a successful TV show like Baby Reindeer that took everyone by surprise. And yeah. afterward, why would this be a surprise? But it was. Yes. yes, of course. So with all this, yeah, I know it's a big question, but where do you see your career heading now? You know, what? it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, as in, I'm so glad that I got to do this project. I mean, it's been a good few years after film school. I've been really pushing to do more, more and more narrative, but then pandemic happened. There was like many circumstances where I wasn't getting where I wanted. And, and then finally, you know, when I got the script, I was like, okay, well, then we're going on the journey here and, and, and I'm really, enjoying it and i think for me it's just i hope i'll get to do more more narrative projects with that kind of character driven stories you know and, and i think we'll just see what, what's right and uh but yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm excited what what future brings for sure and and you know it, it was a huge surprise for us as well that it did so it's doing so well i mean we knew it was a good script and we knew it's a good story but but obviously that it blew up beyond our expectations so 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 yeah i think i kind of i want to do more i would love to do more film because i think sometimes you can explore things in film that you can't explore in television so we love to do that, but um, I think it's at the end of the day, it's all about like good projects. So let's see. Well, Krzysztof, thank you for taking the time. Thank you very much. Congrats on this wonderful show. And I'm really rooting for you in yeah. regard to your future projects. I can't wait to see what you do now. <laughs> thank you, Aaron. It was lovely to meet you. <laughs>